Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another live streaming session from the Naperville Astronomical Association, your Western Suburban Chicago Land uh, Astronomy Club. I am at our uh, DuPage Valley Observatory uh, on our, our Astronomy Education Center campus this evening. Uh, behind the camera that I'm looking at there is Kurt, who's helping me out here. We also have uh, Jim in our control room and Rick, who is going to be taking us on a guided tour of some features on the moon um, in just a little bit. But uh, we're starting out with a view of Jupiter here. Um, it's a lovely clear evening. And if you're in a place where you can look out the window or you step outside, you look straight south, there is a half moon, or what we call first quarter moon, that's about half full hanging in the south, just a little bit to the uh, east of south, uh, directly south pretty much now. The bright star at about the same elevation of the moon is Jupiter. Of course, it's not a star, but bright dot in the sky there. It's really the second brightest thing in the sky period now uh, behind the moon itself. Up above the moon is Saturn. We'll try stopping by Saturn in a minute, but uh, before we get to our moon tour, we thought, gee, We've got these big bright planets out. Why don't we take a little look at them? Here in the observatory, we actually have two telescopes going. Um, there, one is piggybacked on the other one. This uh, view is through the smaller diameter but longer telescope, the uh, six inch reflecting telescope. It being a longer telescope, it gives us a little bit bigger image uh, when we use it as a camera lens like we are now. So that's giving us this live view of Jupiter you're looking at. So why doesn't Jupiter on the screen here look as beautifully crisp and clear as uh, the pictures you see from the Hubble Space Telescope or from uh, fancy cameras here on Earth? Well, it's because we have a live view and we're looking through the turbulence in the atmosphere. That's a big thing. If you're looking outside now, you'll notice that Jupiter isn't very high in the sky. Um, it's not even halfway up the sky. So the lower to the horizon we look, the more air we're looking through, the atmosphere on the Earth is actually very thin. And when we look straight up, we're not looking through that much air, but the farther we look down in the sky, the more and more air we're looking at. We're probably looking through 15 times as much air down here as we would be if we were looking straight up. So the turbulence in the air that blurs the light that cause stars to twinkle and cause our images like this Jupiter to get fuzzy or look like they're underwater, that gets worse the farther down in the sky we go. So oftentimes when we look through telescopes around this part of the country, especially where we're not that high above sea level, uh, our images are a little bit blurry. They don't look like the crisp, sharp, clear pictures. That's why professional observatories are up on mountaintops, so they're looking through less air, and why they sent the Hubble Space Telescope into space, so it wouldn't have to look through air at all. But this is what we can do now. Also, the video camera doesn't have as good resolution as your eye, so uh, what we can pick up on the screen isn't going to be even as detailed as you might pick up in glimpses looking through a telescope at it. But that's Jupiter. It's live. Um, its moons are around it, but the surface of Jupiter is so much brighter than the, the uh, surface of the moons for us that if I turn the camera up so the moons would start to come out, then Jupiter would go all white and start to kind of overload on the screen because uh, it'd be so overexposed. So we've got the camera turned down to see a little bit more of the banding on the surface. You can see some cloud banding. The dark stripes are called belts. That's simple enough. And the white stripes between are called zones. And uh, especially the, the belt up, that's up the upper part of the image the way you're seeing it uh, is quite wide and you can see that it's very uneven. If you had a good telescope and got a good magnified view of it, you'd see all sorts of uh, swirls in the clouds there. What we're looking at is two layers of clouds. The dark stripes are a little bit lower clouds. The light stripes are a little bit higher. Um, Jim tells me that looking from the feed we're giving, uh, probably on most screens that you're, you're seeing it on, you might find that if you step back from your screen a little bit, it actually looks a little sharper. If you get really close to it, you'll tend to notice the blurriness more, but you might actually pick out the detail a little bit more if you're not holding it, you're not really close to the screen. We find that here in the observatory too, that if you're back a little bit, 
fact, you, you can sometimes uh, see a, a little bit clearer than you can if you're closer to it. So um, I should point out that as with all of our streaming things, we can take questions tonight. If you are on Facebook, just put them in the comments section and Jim is watching that. He'll either answer the questions if he's if it's a simple, something or other that's uh, just a factual thing that he can answer in there, or he might pass them along to Rick or me well, uh, during the evening and we'll answer them on the air if he thinks they're a general interest things. Um, if you're not watching on Facebook, if you're watching from the League of Surrounding Club website, or if you just prefer it, you can also send us an email. And I think we're using questions at, is that <laughs> correct, Jim? Uh, yeah, questions at naperastro.org. Okay, so that's, that's what to do there too, to send an email right now. He's watching that mail account, so if you have a question, we should be able to get to it in real time also. I think what I will do, and this is kind of an experiment, we, uh, Kurt and I were just setting things up before we went on the air, uh, and we got Jupiter in. I haven't tried imaging Saturn yet, but I think I'm going to take a moment and uh, try to get over to Saturn. Rick, did you have anything to, you wanted to give as an introduction about what you're going to be doing tonight while I spend the next minute and a half trying to get Saturn on the screen? Uh, no, not really, folks. Uh, it's just going to be a, uh, a little walking tour of some of the uh, some of the major craters that are visible on the moon tonight, and uh, and the straight wall. So it should be fairly straightforward. Okay, um, I am trying to uh, hopefully get Saturn in the view here. Switch back and forth cameras for what I'm seeing. Let's try it turning up our lead. There's Saturn. Oh, don't go away, Saturn. I have to remember that this camera moves opposite of the other camera. Now I'm going to have to change the setting on the camera because Saturn is so much dimmer. Uh, although, how does that look, Jim, to you? It's honestly, it's not that bad. Okay, because yeah. I'm looking at it and the observatory monitor, the contrast is turned way up, but on my laptop, it doesn't look too bad. So maybe we're okay there. So uh, when we use the telescope, like a camera lens like this, uh, it's exactly like a fixed focus camera lens. We can't zoom it. We can't change the magnification. So you're seeing Saturn at the same magnification you just saw Jupiter on, you notice it looks smaller. Saturn is smaller than Jupiter, but it's almost twice as far away from us. So uh, that's the main reason why it, it looks smaller in the sky to us, is it's so much farther away. I, and also, I had to change the exposure because Saturn's quite a bit dimmer because it's almost twice as far away from the sun, so the sunlight there is actually fainter. So uh, we're seeing it because of reflected sunlight, but the sunlight's fainter out there. and. Uh, it isn't that the planet is a darker color than Jupiter, really. It's just that it's in a dimmer spot. So uh, we, uh, it doesn't look as bright in the sky. If you, again, if you go up tonight, you've got the moon and Saturn above and Jupiter off to the side. And Jupiter looks way brighter. And that's, again, because Jupiter is angularly bigger in the sky for us, but it's also the, the sunlight's brighter there where it is. So I think we're going to go down now to the moon. We did our pit stop with planets. Uh, you know, Drew, before you leave Saturn, um, okay. one thing worth mentioning, and it's it's actually coming through pretty well, even on the view that we've got here, at least on my screen. Uh, if you look on the, the rings on the left side of the planet, uh, it looks almost like they don't quite join up at the, uh, uh, at the top left corner. And what you're seeing there, that dark spot, is actually the shadow of the of the disk of, uh, of Saturn on the rings. That's correct. So uh, the way we're seeing it, the, the sun is kind of in the same direction that we are from Saturn. So we're seeing it from the spotlit side from the sun, but the rings are tilted up behind the planet. So you get that shadow effect. And that's, that's a cool thing. The, the tilt of the rings from our perspective 
changes as Saturn goes around the sun, which takes, what, about 23 years, 24 years, something like that? Um, 22 years something, I believe it is. <laughs> I'm terrible with numbers. But anyway, um, the rings are tilted to the solar system. So as we go around the sun, or, or it goes around the sun, and we see it from different angles. Uh, we see it the top side of the ring, the bottom side of the ring, and in between that, we go to a point where we see the rings edge on and they just about disappear for a short period of time because they're very, very thin. But it's a beautiful sight to see in a telescope, even if it's a little bit blurry like this. Um, this is probably comparable to a view, many views you would see in a fairly small telescope on an average night around here. Again, if you weren't on a mountaintop at 100,000, or I mean at 10,000 feet, as opposed to the uh, 640 feet we're at here at the observatory. Um, yes, that little spot on the rig. <laughs> there's a, yeah, there's a, a bright spot on this camera, uh, which happens to cameras, especially low light cameras after a while. This camera has been around for a while. So uh, yeah, that thing there is not a UFO. It is not um, uh, anything to do with Saturn. See, I can make Saturn jiggle and that stays perfectly still because it's part of the camera. It's not part of the sky. So, uh, okay, we will go to the moon. I think what I'm going to do is switch off to the other camera right off the bat. So you have to give me a second for that because I have to pull some cables. I'm going to make the screen go black too. So if you're joining us late, if you have any questions, you can post them in Facebook and uh, someone will try to answer those live for you. So you can barely see it the way this camera is adjusted, but um, Saturn is still on the screen there. This is the other telescope. It's actually a bigger telescope, but the camera is adjusted differently. And uh, this, you can see the difference in magnification. This telescope is a little more than half the magnification that the other one was at. So uh, this is the one we're going to take to the moon. And so, here we go. Drew, we have a we have a, a question on Facebook, and sure, it, it'd be easier for you to answer it than for me to try to type the answer. Okay. <laughs> uh, Monica asks, "Can we pick up Pluto?" Uh, she thinks it's sitting between Jupiter and Saturn right now. It is actually, um, and with our the camera that we use to look at faint objects like if you were with us weren't we out here last week uh looking at uh star clusters and gas clouds with that camera we could pretty easily pick up pluto the trouble is anytime we set that camera to the sensitivity you need and point it to the area of the sky where pluto is you would see scores of little faint stars in it because there's a lot of little faint stars out there Pluto would only be one of those faintest little dots on the screen, and you wouldn't know which one it is. <laughs> so Pluto is too far away from the Earth for any telescope on the Earth to really see the disk of it. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope with its resolution can make Pluto cover several pixels on its camera, but you don't really see the disk of it. With most other telescopes, it's just a point, like a star. So you don't see any details on it, and you can't tell which star it is unless you've got a very accurate chart, and you just compare the chart to the sky and say, okay, I see this extra thing there, so that's Pluto. So I've looked at it. Uh, we could certainly image it with the camera here, but it would not make your day. <laughs> Sometime when we have live observing out here, ask us, and we might put it in a telescope live that you can look through the telescope and see it. And you won't know which one of the little faintest dots it is, but you could say you saw it because it was one of those little dots in the screen. So uh, it's just not a very exciting object. I'm going to go down to the moon. Uh, that's probably going to get really bright all of a sudden. And uh, <laughs> there we go. There's moon. Uh, Rick, um, so we're on the, uh, the main camera of, on the uh, 12 and a half inch telescope now. This will be, since this has got a single mirrored system, this is going to be right and left mirrored, uh, north and south are correct. I think I can probably flip that on my tablet. Would that make a big difference for you? Should I see if I can do that? 
um, because for instance, um, if I do this, you'll note that the bright side of the moon, the sunlit side is on the, uh, I should not push the telescope, I should do this. The sunlit side is on the left-hand side of the screen, whereas up in the sky, the sunlit side is the right-hand side of the moon. So, yeah. so yeah, again, if you can do a, if you can do a mirror image uh, flip, that would be helpful. Let me see if I can do that with this camera set up. If not, it's not the end of the world. I think it might be possible. Oh, there it is this camera. You can even see my little thing here. No, there isn't a flip that shows on this. Okay. Um, resolution. Unless it's down here. Oh, flip. No, I want to flip it. <laughs> I don't want to flip it horizontally. I don't want to flip it vertically. Um, that won't help much. Yeah, because that would be that. And that doesn't really help much. Just slip, turn it upside down and then it's backwards both ways. Um, no, I'm sorry. I'm going to just be confusing you because I didn't think about that with this um, this telescope for doing your touring on that uh, everything is going to be coming okay. backwards. Not anyway, a I'm problem. I can reverse it in my mind as we go along. So Are we going to start at the north? Pardon me? Are we starting at the north end of the We're starting at the north with uh, with the crater Plato, which mm -hmm. the early astronomers who first started examining the moon in telescopes in the 1600s referred to as the Great Black Lake, because they assumed that everything on the uh, everything on the moon that was dark was was water. And when we get there, you're going to see we're going past the number of things we're going to talk about tonight, but uh, we'll get up so to Plato I and start there. Rick, I also have the camera set in manual mode, so I can adjust the uh, exposure to however you want it to pick out whatever details you're looking okay. for. Okay. Well, right now, as we go by, this is uh, most of this is looking pretty uh, pretty workable. So there's our friend. Looking a little bit into the middle. Okay. All right, so Plato is just about 100 kilometers or 62 miles across, but it's only one kilometer deep uh, because its, its floor is, was flooded with lava uh, a couple of billion years ago after the crater was created, but while the moon was still geologically active. So if you look at, uh, let me see if I can... Pointed out for you here. Okay, so there's whoop. that didn't work very well. Sorry about the rocking, I'm trying to stabilize things. Okay, here. there we go. Uh, there's uh, there's the crater that we're looking at. Is that uh, that big fellow there? Uh, and underneath all that dark, flat, smooth-looking surface is about two and a half kilometers uh, of solidified lava that seeped up through cracks in the floor of the crater over time and buried everything that was inside it, including its, uh, its central peaks, which is we're going to see later when we look at some of the craters that did not fill with lava. Uh, they can be pretty tall, impressive structures. Other interesting things about, uh, about Plato is the nice, uh, nice row of shadows that we're getting off the east wall of the crater. Uh, I'm not sure if we have quite enough magnification to see how jagged they look, but the uh, uh, the shadows show a, uh, a a very jagged wall top there. And over on the right side of the of the crater, uh, there's a little dimple that looks almost like somebody put a handle on it on the bright white rim of the crater. Uh, that little uh, triangular feature is a, a well-known uh, sort of a defect in the crater called Plato Zeta, 
exactly. And it's a scenario of slumped in material in the wall where part of the wall just literally collapsed and it's uh, separated from the rest of the crater by, uh, by rock slides on either side. Rick, I would, I would also say, I didn't mention this before we got started, but uh, the other camera on the higher power telescope is still going and we've got them fairly well aligned. So if, if you think the scene allows and for any particular object, you want to try to flip to the other view, again, that takes maybe about 15 seconds to flip. The well, you know, if you, uh, if you want to see if you can put uh, Plato in the six inch, that might be interesting because those shadows really do look... Uh, uh, very sawtoothed and uh, and jagged. Uh, okay, so when once again, when I'll magnified. be cutting off this view for a moment. And we'll see what comes up here. The connection. Now this, this image is not near reversed. Right. So, <laughs> so um, your, uh, you have to have, do your mental flip. So your handle on the crater is over on the left-hand side now there, obviously. Right. Yep. So I can center it a little bit more. Okay, it's really not much more, uh, not much more detailed than, uh, than the other image. Yeah, we're kind of at the seeing limit for this right. evening, I think, there. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, we can continue with either camera. Actually, you know, now that, uh, now that it's stopped moving, uh, there is a little more of that you get a little more sense of the uh, jaggedness of the uh, of the wall top there uh, in this view. Okay, if you want to uh, take just a moment before we head south, it's it's very subtle and it wasn't going to be part of the tour tonight, but I see it's it's visible. You can see what looks like a sort of a slash going across the uh, uh, right there, going across from left to right. And that's the uh, the so-called Alpine Valley. It cuts through uh, that mountain chain that uh, that passes through uh, passes through Plato, which are called the Lunar Alps. And it's actually an area that was uh, that was carved out by debris from a lunar impact that literally just uh, plowed its way through uh, the the existing surface and left that uh, left that little ditch, a well, big ditch actually, uh, in its wake. So Drew, if you want to head south, we're going to uh, head down to a group of three craters that is going to be hard to miss as we get there. One, two, and three. Okay, so... Right there, we've got uh, we've got three craters called Aristillus, Autolycus, and Archimedes, uh, all starting with A, but uh, not having too much in in common. Beyond that, what's uh, what's interesting to see here is the uh, the crater at the at the left side of this train, right over here, which is Archimedes. Uh, has a has a flooded floor like like Plato did, and it's it's very flat and unblemished. And on, on the other hand, if you look over here at uh, at Aristillus, which is it's not quite as big, but uh, uh, really probably more like uh, more like what Ar Archimedes looked like before it filled with lava. Uh, it's not as detailed as I would like it to be, but you can certainly see that we've got a uh, uh, crater there on the uh, the second of the two, uh, with a very steep and very deep wall. Uh, the walls of uh, Aristillus are about 3.6 kilometers, or about two and a quarter miles from the floor of the crater to the top of the wall. So it'd be a pretty impressive place to be uh, to be walking around. Uh, and there are uh, some multiple uh, central peaks that we can see in Aristolus, the, the light areas near the center of the crater, where the impactor that caused the crater hit the moon, pushed its crust in, and then when the crust rebounded, it, uh, it left these uh, large uh, half mile tall mountain peaks in its wake.
and on the other hand, then on Archimedes, Archimedes rather, um, those uh, those peaks would have been there when the crater was formed because of the size. We know that it would have formed central peaks, but uh, they've been completely buried in the uh, in the lava. So if you want to head a little farther south, Drew, we'll see if we can find Eratosthenes. over there at the southwest end of the uh, mountain chain right there and that actually if you hold it right there uh, before we get too far that's that's actually a great uh, uh, we're getting a great view uh, of Eratosthenes you can see you get a sense uh, looking at it at this angle how deep it is and how steep those interior walls are and we're getting a pretty good view of the uh, of the central peaks again uh, uh, some appreciation of uh, how how tall and how uh, um, how steep they are. There are, if you look above and to the left of the crater over here. Whoops, sorry. Over here and here. Boy, I didn't do that very well. Let me try it again. Right here and right here. We've got a couple of uh, mare ridges, or basically wrinkles in the lava of this large area of, uh, of lava, mare imbrium, where uh, the, the lava literally uh, left ridges as it, uh, as it hardened. And it sort of looks like, uh, sort of looks like waves on an ocean to uh, uh, continue the image that the original astronomers had that, that these were bodies of water. Then if you want to head south again, we'll pick up uh, another trio of craters. Uh, farther from the Terminator, and we're still there. We go. We're just starting to. They're just starting to come into view now. You want to be closer to the Terminator? You want to be this way? Uh, no, 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 no. You're. Uh, uh, what we're looking for is at the lower right corner right now. So, uh, if you want to just keep going south, we'll. One, two, and one more to go. There we go. So we have uh, three overlapping craters, uh, one of the with uh, with a fourth one uh, just above it. And the three craters are, are interesting because uh, they uh, they proceed sort of in age order. The one at the top is the oldest of the three, uh, which we can tell because if you look at its walls, you can see that they're uh, they've been pretty pretty well beaten up over the uh, over the eons it, they're not nearly the sharp uh, detailed kind of walls that we saw a couple of minutes ago with Eratosthenes it's a flooded floor so the central peak is uh, the central peak is buried the one underneath it is sort of a middle-aged crater uh, you can see its central peak but it's not as pronounced Certainly nowhere near as pronounced as the one in Eratosthenes, and not as pronounced as the one in the crater underneath it, which is uh, which is Arzakal. And then Arzakal, the crater at the bottom, is the youngest of the three, which we know from the the, the sharpness of the uh, um, central peak, and we can see a, quite a bit of terracing. If I get the arrow out of the way, and the, particularly in that wall on the right, you can get a sense of. Uh, uh, a lot of how some of the detail uh, that we can see on those inner walls as part of them have uh, begun to slump down, part of them have not, and they end up with a very, uh, very intricate uh, terraced appearance. You can also see on the floors of uh, both the crater at the top and the crater at the bottom, uh, we have some, some later craters that uh, left their own marks on the, uh, on the floors.
Now, if we look just down and to the left from the craters we were looking at a moment ago, now we come to a really nice feature on the moon right there, uh, which is called uh, the straight wall, or the British like to call it the railway. And uh, other people call it uh, Huygens' sword because of the uh, uh, little feature at the bottom that uh, looks almost like the hilt of an old uh, musketeer's sword. And what you're looking at is a scarp or fault line that's a little over 100 kilometers long. So it's, you know, maybe 65, 70 miles from end to end, uh, where two adjacent slabs on the moon are, are offset from each other. Uh, and while it looks like that's a, a very steep, almost like a cliff, like the white cliffs of Dover or the dark cliffs of Dover, I guess, in this view, uh, it's, it's really not near anywhere near as, uh, as, as steep as it looks. It's, the feature is somewhere between 800 and 1500 feet tall. Uh, and its slope is only about 15 or 20 degrees. But when we get the uh, uh, the morning sun coming in, uh, it does uh, make a pretty dramatic, uh, pretty dramatic view. Uh, the fact that there's the two little craters to the left and right that uh, uh, look look disturbingly like uh, somebody's eyes looking back at you is uh, something I can't do anything about. Uh, there's my little face. So then, Drew, if we can just head south, we got one more uh, one more to look at while we're here. One more uh, nice complex crater. Looking for Tycho. Rick, would you be able to speak to the the benefit of looking at um, the moon in a phase versus looking at the moon during a full moon? Like why we're seeing so much more detail? Sure. Um, this is actually a good, uh, a good place to stop for that. Um, if you, if you look at what we're seeing here, all of the areas that are showing us, us detail, the detail is, is, uh, revealed by the, by the, uh, interplay of, of lights and light and shadows. Uh, if you look farther to the right in the view, where there's fewer shadows, you don't see much detail. Uh, all you all you see is uh, is the uh, highlight and uh, and no no shadow to set it off and and give you a sense of uh, what's really going on. The full moon when when the moon is full, it's basically noon on the moon, and just like here, uh, the shadows are shortest at noon. And uh, there's, there's very little detail to be seen on the moon when it's full. Uh, the best time to see, uh, to see features uh, on the moon, uh, at least features that you know, have three-dimensional uh, three aspects to them, is at, uh, at sunrise and sunset when the shadows are longest and the detail comes out best. But however, uh, there are a lot of features on the moon. We're going to talk about uh, one of them in just a minute that can only be seen at full moon uh, because it, they just do not show up uh, with the kind of low uh, low level illumination uh, or low angle illumination that we have at sunrise and sunset. And they're only seen at uh, uh, under high illumination at or around full moon. And if we head a little bit farther, I think we're still a little bit north of Tycho, Drew. Yes. No, is that Tycho? They, that's, that's Tycho right there. Yeah, um, yeah it's deep in shadow. Huh? I can center it a little bit more. Maybe yeah. the, I can adjust the camera if you want me to. Uh... No, that's okay. It's uh, uh, because. Okay, so Tycho is uh, the youngest major crater, at least on the side of the moon that we can see. It's only about 100, uh, 100 million years old, which is a, really a baby on the moon. And it 
if we could see it better, we would, uh, it's still a little bit on the dark side of the Terminator, but uh, it's a, a very detailed, well-terraced uh, crater with uh, central peaks and uh, lots of detail inside, like some of the other ones we've seen tonight. But what is uh, is most amazing about Tycho is something we can't see right now, and that is the ray system that comes out from it. Uh, when you look at the moon or look at pictures of the full moon, uh, down near the south end of the moon, there is always a very big, unmistakable uh, system of rays that spreads out from, from a point down there near the south end and uh, goes on practically to the other side of the moon. Uh, the rays that, uh, that came out from Tycho uh, cover 1,500 kilometers, which is well over half the, uh, half the circumference of the, uh, of the moon. And what's interesting, if you look at pictures of the full moon, or if you look at the full moon in a, in a telescope uh, live, the rays go in every direction except west. And that tells us that the uh, the object that created the Tycho crater uh, came in from the west at a really a pretty low angle uh, so that it did not throw anything, throw any material backwards, it threw everything forwards and, uh, and out to the sides. The rays are light colored uh, in comparison to the, to the rest of the moon's surface because it's material that was dredged up during the formation of the crater from uh, just under the surface. Uh, and the material just below the surface is lighter than the stuff on top because the stuff on top has been uh, uh, pulverized and, uh, and darkened by literally uh, millions of years of exposure to little micrometeorites, which basically, uh, uh, hit the moon constantly uh, because it has no atmosphere to deflect them uh, or to cause them to burn up on their way in like we do. And so features like that, uh, the, uh, the, the rays from uh, major craters and also some other uh, uh, features that aren't three-dimensional but, uh, but just uh, changes in color uh, are visible on the moon only uh, at full moon and not uh, not along the Terminator. Rick, do you know how deep Tycho Crater is off the top of your head? Uh, Tycho is uh, 4.8 uh, kilometers or about a little less than three miles deep. So if you, uh, uh, you know, if you're... Uh, if you had to crawl out of it, I, I, I would not envy you. It would not be uh, would not be an easy climb, and it's about uh, fifty two miles or eighty five kilometers across. So that's about all that I had for tonight. So if anybody's got any other questions, be happy to talk. Uh, we do not have any more. I guess uh, we could point out we didn't mention that um, actually tomorrow night is officially International Observe the Moon Night. And the reason we're not doing this tomorrow night is because here in Chicagoland, the weather forecast is for lousy for tomorrow and it was good for tonight. So we're like, we will do our, we will be untraditional and do our moon observing on the night before international. Of course, it's, it's International Observe the Moon Day somewhere already and now, I guess, <laughs> if you follow the date line. I'll just take us up on a pan back up the moon um, once I convince the telescope to go. So if you see anything uh, exciting along the way that you want to stop and look at. Uh, again, as Rick pointed out, the farther to the uh, the uh, right side of your, your image, further over this way, the more the sun is, is higher in the sky for someone standing on the moon there at a certain point. So the shadows are going away more and more and more. And uh, 
the moon over there on the right side of the screen is really on the average just as bumpy as the stuff on the left we just don't see it like this can you see the rays coming across there that stretch pretty much across the screen there's there's definitely a ray that's uh, going from uh, uh, lower left to about right, middle from, right from and that's this. probably uh, that's probably part of that's almost certainly I from Tycho. That's, that's from a Tycho, yeah so that's those are the rays that rick is talking about yeah, did you guys more, speak to uh maybe there's sometimes there's a misunderstanding between the dark side of the moon and the far side of the moon can you could you maybe speak to that a little bit drew or rick well there is no dark side of the moon uh, any more than except to the extent that there's a dark side of the earth uh, because the moon rotates on its axis just like we do and sometimes it's day and sometimes it's night no matter where you are on the moon however what there is is a far side which is uh, the side of the moon that that we never see and that happened because the uh, the moon has much less mass than the earth does and as it uh, as it rotates around around the much more massive Earth, uh, the moon does what all smaller bodies rotating around larger ones eventually tend to do, which is they, they enter a so-called synchronous orbit where the amount of time that it takes the moon to make a revolution on its axis is the same amount of time uh, that it takes the moon to make one trip around the, uh, around the Earth in its orbit. So as the moon as the moon moves, uh, it it is constantly turning its face towards us, uh, and it's keeping its back away from us as it uh, as it walks around, which is why you know we always see the same uh, the same side of the uh, of the moon and never never see the far side unless of course you're. Uh, in, in, in a space capsule uh, on the other side of the moon. So there are some ray structures around some yeah, of these I can't remember which, craters down yeah. uh, right. by the edge there. And it's what you, marks. what you, one thing you know about any crater that has visible rays is that it's relatively young uh, because again, the, uh, uh, the rays are light colored material that uh, has not yet been uh, undergone uh, weathering to bring it back to that sort of uh, grayish color that the rest of the moon's surface is. Uh, but eventually uh, all of those rays will be uh, obliterated by, uh, by weathering and uh, won't be visible anymore. I think an interesting thing too, uh, Rick, that not everybody necessarily knows is the moon has been observed through telescopes for quite a while now, and it's been very well mapped down to the features that you can see in telescopes. So any little blip you see on the screen here, whether it's a crater or a mountain or some sort of fault or rill, um, they're all named. So you can spend an inordinate amount of your life, uh, even if you with a fairly small telescope and maps of the moon, going from one feature to the next and uh, figuring out which what name it is, because there there aren't. It's like stars in the sky all have numbers, pretty much. If you can see them, uh, there isn't really a feature on the moon that doesn't have a name to it. And, uh, uh, we don't. Amateur astronomers sometimes ignore the moon and like to look out farther into the universe more, but uh, it's a fascinating object to observe, uh, even in a moderately small telescope. Uh, you don't need a big diameter telescope to gather a lot of light because the moon is so bright and uh, you can see it in the city where you can't see really anything else in the sky because of the light pollution. But uh, it's a it's a great object for observing. I'm going to turn the camera back up. I turned it down because um, there's over on the bright part there. Uh, so here we are back at the north end. Now there's our friend Plato again. Now Plato does have uh, a couple of little 
two kilometer wide uh, bowl shaped craters in its floor that uh, are often used by uh, people to check the uh, the resolution of their telescopes. Uh, I, I don't know that I would want to do that test with this telescope, but. <laughs> That with a that with a five hundred line video camera is probably more the limit for it. But yeah, we didn't start out at the very top edge of the moon, so we uh, go all the way up towards the North Pole here. But so that's pretty much our moon for the evening. If there are any other questions out there. I'm happy that everybody could celebrate uh, International Observe the Moon Night with us. And you got a couple of big planets tossed in for the fun of it. Again, I would repeat the whole effect that you're seeing of the looking like the moon is at the bottom of a swimming pool here, that those are all heat waves in our atmosphere. It's just like if you look over a hot road in the summertime and see these wavy effects. You've got hot air rising in, in cells and cool and, and lumps and bubbles and uh, cool air sinking and those temperature differences in the, the uh, air bend the light. It's what causes stars to twinkle um, and always kind of limits the amount of detail we can see in our telescopes. Our good telescopes that we use as amateur astronomers can theoretically see down things down below a mile in size on the moon. People ask if we can see the bottoms of the spaceships or the lunar rovers or something or other. Actually, there's no telescope on Earth that can see the man-made things in the moon, on the moon because those are all a matter of feet and yards across and not miles or parts of miles. But uh, it's again, it's because we're looking through the Earth's atmosphere mm -hmm. and even big telescopes are looking through the Earth's atmosphere. So there's a limit to the size. But as I was saying, there's just thousands and thousands of features you can see on the moon if you look at every hill and every hole and uh, um, all the different effects of lava and things. So it's a fascinating thing to look at. It's our, it's our nearby object, just like we have the sun as our nearby star that we can look at the features on when we can't look at any other star that way. This is the other planetary sized body that's close enough that we can just look at it and see the details like this. So we appreciate the moon. And we're happy that you joined us to look at it tonight. Still no other questions or anything to answer, Jim? Uh, no, there are no more questions. You, there was one about weather conditions, but I think you kind of answered that with the... Uh, yeah, I, I guess I can point out, I don't want to always be too pedantic, but uh, <laughs> this turbulence you're seeing in the air does vary from night to night. Uh, the turbulence we call seeing is sky gazers as amateur astronomers, actually professional astronomers call it that too, the amount of turbulence in the air. And it does vary from night to night. There are nights when we couldn't get anywhere and show you anywhere near the detail that we are tonight even because it would be so much blurrier. Rarely do we have nights here in the northern Illinois area where the atmosphere is closer to perfectly steady and you could zoom in more and see more details. It happens occasionally, but once again, because of the place we are on the world, we are uh, in the middle of the continent and the air tends to mix here with the air coming in from the north and the south and the west and stirring up. Um, there's usually some turbulence and we're also very low. Uh, we're only, our observatory here is 640 feet above sea level. Again, that's why professional observatories are built at 10,000 feet above sea level and uh, 15,000 feet above sea level is to get uh, have less air doing this over them. Uh, but we look at how good a night is for observing in two factors. One is how clear it is, which is pretty simple. How cloudy, how hazy is it is? Is it tonight? It's reasonably clear. I'm looking at the moon and it's a little bit yellow because we're still under a, a moderate amount of smoke from the unfortunate wildfires uh, plaguing the Western United States. Um, last week, uh, we've had some nights where you couldn't even see the stars in the clear sky because of the amount of smoke in the air. So we call that clarity of whether there's uh, something obscuring the light coming in, whether it's clouds or haze or moisture, 
vapor, or unfortunately, if it's smog or smoke, uh, we call that transparency. So how transparent is the sky? And then, as I say, we call the turbulence in the air the seeing. And those two factors actually aren't related at all. You can have a night that's very transparent with very poor seeing or vice versa. Uh, we wish that every night was perfectly transparent or clear and with perfect seeing or perfect steadiness. So uh, we can do the viewing of all the things in, in, in a magnificent way, but uh, we deal with what we can get. And again, so I think we'll call it quits. Um, well, Drew, Drew, one thing okay. I think is worth pointing out too is if somebody was viewing the moon without a camera, they wouldn't notice the waviness as much. The, I, the camera really uh, yeah. adds adds to that. So you can you can really put a decent amount of magnification on the moon even on a bad night, and and you're not going to notice it being as wavy as as uh, as the camera's making it appear. That's very true, Jim. It's good you pointed that out because even tonight, if we had an eyepiece in this telescope that we're looking through the view to your eye would be better than what I can show you on the screen. And that's, there's two parts to that. Um, our brains can look at a changing image like this and capture mentally, our, our visual system can capture the sharp moments. Because when you have this waviness, it'll be clearer and wavier and clearer and wavier. And our brain can look at that and say, I saw this detail and kind of remember it and put together a picture that way. The video just takes it all and dumps it on you. Also, the other thing is the cameras are not as good as our eyes for doing this kind of observing. Because I say this is a, a uh, closed circuit TV camera, basically. It's not a computer camera where the computer is processing the image. So there's a very relatively low resolution that this camera has, which isn't anywhere near as good as your eye. So your eye looking through the telescope can pick up more details and your brain can sort out those details better than the, than the camera can. Um, so it's kind of two things. If you visit us for these observing sessions, last week when we had faint objects in the telescope, the camera can do amazing things to see more, to gather more faint light than our eyes can. So it can see way beyond our eyes. Uh, so in some ways, the camera can deliver a lot of things on the screen that are better than our eyes. When it comes to looking at the planets or the moon, your eyes actually beat the camera. Um, that's true unless you start taking images like this, like these 24 frames a second that we're sending you here and taking each image and then having a, compu a computer process, then you can do that and sharpen up this kind of like I was saying your brain does. You can have a computer do that and come out with nice images. So if you see someone who's got pictures, even from around this area, they can have a much sharper moon than this, but that's by kind of cheating with using the computer as part of the visual system to process things. But just in live video like this, your eye would beat the camera on the moon, but the camera could beat your eye on looking at a faint gas cloud or something out there. So, uh, but since you can't be with us here tonight, this is the best we can do. So thanks a lot to Rick for taking us on another tour and telling us about some of these features. Thanks to Jim whose voice you also heard there for uh, sending the right pictures to you at the right time and also uh, following the, the question feeds. And thanks to Kurt, who's been helping me get our images out of the observatory here tonight. And uh, I hope you can join us again at our next observing session or our next indoor program. Do follow us on our club website, neighborastro.org, where the calendar will tell what upcoming programs we have planned. If you like observing events like this, we planned them more at the last minute. We announced this one yesterday because it looked fairly certain like it was going to be clear tonight. So oftentimes our observing programs will only announce 24 hours or so in advance, sometimes even just the day of if we were uncertain about the weather because even if we plan things, about half the time we plan things around here, it ends up being clouded out. So. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for joining us, and I think we'll sign off for the evening, and I hope to see you out under the stars when we can start doing public activities again. So good night. <laughs>